I'm Gregory A. Daniels. I'm a medical oncologist in San Diego at uh, UC San Diego. So immune therapy, at least you know, what we think about in cancer, is trying to harness your own immune system to switch the tide to fight back at the cancer that's developed in your body. Cancer doesn't develop in a vacuum. Cancer develops in a person. And that person, or there's two things that we think are going on that's interrelated. One is the cancer cells themselves have turned bad or malignant, and those changes have allowed it to grow in an unregulated and immortal state. And that's in the context of your own body, and that support for the tumor, blood vessels and all the things around it, that's another way to say an immune response. So it's your body's own response to the tumor that can either help eliminate the cancer before you even see it. Um, so sometimes when we think about those tumor types that are going up, there may actually be not just a relationship with Chernobyl or some of these other environmental things, but things that are influencing your own immune system. So it, it may even have a role in prevention. Um, but now moving where we are in medical oncology, it's trying to change that tide of that relationship um, as a therapy. Immune therapy is a tool used by actually many areas of medicine. Um, so immune therapy is definitely used in oncology. This has been a big sea change actually in oncology over the last 10 years. There's always been a little trickle of hints that, hey, how about this vaccine, for example, in cervical cancer or interleukin-2 in melanoma, um, but the emphasis has been very small. Now, fast forward 10 years, and it's immune therapy 24-7 in oncology, and it's become a new pillar of cancer care. So we think of radiation, surgery, chemotherapies, and now this fourth kind of pillar of immune therapy. As a pillar, it's not limited to medical oncology. My surgical colleagues are thinking about this. My radiation oncology colleagues are thinking about this. And as it gets back to, it's a fundamental change in that environment that's supporting the growth of the tumor and how can we all affect it. Um, but definitely it's, it's now a new part of cancer care is thinking about these relationships. You know, historically, oncology has not been very involved in thyroid cancer and endocrinology, surgery, uh, those have been the mainstays. Part of that reflected that um, they had the tools that were validated to help people, and we didn't. <laughs> um, so there are now oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors that can help patients who have failed those first-line approaches of surgery and or uh, radiation, and those have improved survivals for patients. So certainly, other people can give these medications, but it kind of fell onto the oncologist because these are similar to other drugs that we use and other tumor types, and they have safety issues that need to be managed that might not be, the endocrinologist might not be comfortable managing, and certainly the surgeon might not want to spend their time managing those type of things. So things have shifted into the oncology world for advanced patients that need something beyond that. Um, that's intersecting what's going on in immune therapies because all of a sudden we're getting new, new drugs for other tumors. Now we have these patients with advanced disease that are in our offices and going, well, hold on a second. We have these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Do we have something better? As this fourth pillar develops of immune therapies, we're trying to see if that applies back down to thyroid cancers. If one has a tumor type that is less common in the oncology office, like thyroid cancer, um, then I would go to a, a specialist that actually does that as part of their um, livelihood. So usually a high volume center will have identified people that have focused down on just a few tumor types. And you know, everybody can prescribe a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, but I think that there's some subtle management issues that come with experience and come with having a patient volume that you know, gives you at least some insight into how to dose adjust things better and things. 
The second one is if you're searching out a medical oncologist, it may be because you have advanced disease. And right now, while we have some good treatments, clinical trials are really kind of where I would like to steer patients if possible, if it makes sense. And again, that would be in a, a center that's usually a little more high volume, like an academic center. Um, so that would be my encouragement. Those things, surgery, iodine, have a documented lead to cure. Immune therapies, while we're seeing some pretty amazing long-term disease control, we're all reluctant at this early stage to say, oh yeah, we got this, we're curing this. Certainly we're making an impact now, um, but if you have an opportunity to cure, um, that trumps everything. Now, what is that opportunity? That's an individual patient thing about you know, where their tumor is and things like that, but um, certainly surgery uh, with or without iodine ablation afterwards is our first consideration when we see a patient.